there's no words um, for Leander. I mean, he's almost like my brother, you know. You always try to welcome me in the smile in the locker room, always give me a great advices and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, it, it was just such an honor to, to always be surrounded by you. When he played that, it's like a ninja playing, you know, it's too person at the net. He's here and then he's there and then I don't know who is who, you know, he was probably the fastest tennis player at the net by far. He was uh, so much fun to play against and I thought I would much rather play with him than against him. He has a good sense of humor. Um, he has a smile on his face. Um, he has a lot of massages. I have to thank you though for the cool, you know, it's how you have friends and they come good for you at some point in time, you know, you hope that they do. You did, for life now. You don't have to do anything for me for life because you made me meet Boris Becker. <laughs> Isn't he just the coolest guy ever? Ever. Stuttgart, Germany, 98, 99 maybe. I was playing um, doubles against him and he was playing with another German boy. I was playing with Mahesh. And in the course of a match, we were, we were beating them. And on the side change, he turned around to me and he goes, so lucky, is that all you got? <laughs> and I burst out laughing. I just cracked up laughing. And we both laughed and we played it off and da da da. And uh, that was a unique one. So I've been very lucky. I've got some great friends out there. Boris Becker, Lendl, Lendl and myself always take each other's trip in the locker room. Oh, he's hard as nails. I thought I used to train really hard back in 91. I thought I was like training really hard and you know, I was so burnt out of tennis and stuff. And, I finally said, let's go and see what the pros train like. He trained so hard. I mean, I was crawling off the court every day. Yeah. He'd do eight hours of tennis. Then after that, he'd go for a run for an hour. And then when I would go back to the room, crawling into my room, into my bed to rest and eat, he'd go out and play 18 holes of golf. With no golf buggy, nothing. He'd just walk around and play. That's Ivan Lendl for you. Yeah. Sadistic. You're dodging bullets because he's just at you all the time. He's breaking your mind down all the time. Yeah. He goes, come on, Indian boy, is that all you got? Or it's... <laughs> You know, waking you up at 3.45 in the morning with 19 German Shepherds right on you, one of them right on your face. My first day at camp, I was warned by Tony Roach to lock my door. I didn't, I was 19 years old at the time. So, 3.45 in the morning, Ivan wakes me up with one German Shepherd just drooling over me right here and bad breath. And I wake up and all I see is these eyes and these teeth. And I caught the dog and I threw him off my bed to only realize there were 19 of them around me and Ivan in the corner laughing. Pitch black, 19 dogs right there. Who's the, who's the life of the locker room? Interestingly and, enough, when Federer gets into a mood, yeah. he's one of the loudest guys in the locker room. Really? When he gets into the mood, he's ragging on everybody. He's, you know, speaking to the German guy, gang in German. He's speaking to the, the, the French gang in French. He's putting on an Indian accent for us. He's, he's one of the sharpest cats uh, about any subject. So he's always taking, you know, like uh, cracks at other guys. Uh, Djokovic, uh, Novak's another... Um, yeah. Um, amazing brain. Who's the guy you stay away from? You will, let's not mess with this fella. Like through the years that you've played, a guy who just gone like, we just have to leave him in his zone. Sampras. Yeah? Yeah. Sampras you'd leave alone. He was more of an introvert. Um, I was very lucky to be his sparring partner back uh, in Florida back in the day. Yeah. And I would train with him all the time. I've played him four times. Uh, one in singles, three in doubles. Um, never lost to him, but one of the, the real uh, introverts and, and, and very quiet, had his own rhythm. Paul Anacone, who was his coach. Um, Dougie Spreen, who was his physiotherapist. Always kept him in his own little cocoon. Never let him get out of it. And complete contrast, Agassi was just there in the locker room with everybody, chit-chatting, laughing, joking, talking about you know how your mom and dad are, talking about the last meal you ate, where the best curry house is, and just the life of the party. Have you ever met Gabriel Sabati? Many a time. Should have pursued my tennis here. <laughs> to meet what you guys don't know is that we both have a huge crush on Sabatini. I had a poster over like my room. I, I kid you not. A sports star poster? I've never. I've never Everything's falling here. It's all crashing. It's, just, it's coming apart, man. It seems. <laughs> I'm going to say something really embarrassing right okay. now. I had a, so when I was 10 years old, I had a poster of Gabriela Sabatini in my room. Is really sweet. Like she's wearing a sweatshirt and jeans and, and she's at a beach next to a rock and she, it's this really sweet like 
I'm in love with you kind of poster. That's the sports star poster. No, it was a big after one. After she to, won. No, no, you have to you have to buy those big ones. Really? This, is not one of this was after ones. she won US Open. Huh? It was a Sun Magazine piece. So no, it was. I remember buying it from Archie's gallery. <laughs> we got another Sabatini fan. Right? <laughs> the whole crew is fans of Sabatini. <laughs> it, he still has it. I can't believe it. Give it to me now. <laughs> now. Now. I want it. Chori kare. <laughs> and also, I, I don't know if it was for you, but watching matches of Sabatini and and Steffi Steffi Graf Graf. was very difficult because you didn't know who to root. Yeah. yeah. Both were stunning athletes. Huh? Yeah. Was you, that US Open final that they won, once played was no, just... No, it was not for the tennis. You know, they're beautiful both of them. Mm -hmm. What was your, their favourite shot that you liked? Anyone where they grunted. <laughs> <laughs> this breakfast of champions is going down the gutter. <laughs> no, it's just... Do you remember when you asked uh, or when you thought about asking Martina Navratilova to play with you? She asked me actually. Oh, she asked you? She walked into the men's locker room. There was a knock on the men's locker room and we all kind of looked at the door saying, who's going to knock? Someone's going to walk in. And in walks Navratilova and she taps me on my chest. She goes, you are going to play with me. I'm like, alright. <laughs> who's going to say no to Navratilova? No. You will play with me. Yes, let's sign. Sign kar li. Kahan pe sign maru? <laughs> And we ended up playing for four great years. We ended up winning multiple slams together. And it was the start of one of the, the great friendships and uh, one of my, the pillars in my, in my, in my team. Um, my 9 p.m. phone call at the MD Anderson when I was uh, a little under the weather. But we, let's, let's talk about your illness because you just sort of referred to it for a second. Uh, darkest period of your life? Through my whole life, I've had uh, a few dark periods. Yeah. When I was a kid, I was born with a mitral valve prolapse. Uh, close to 100 doctors told my dad that either I was never going to be an athlete again yeah. or that I was not going to live beyond the age of 12. Yeah. And there was a one Dr. Cherian down in Chennai. I had to do my uh, medical test before I went off to Tennis Academy. And I remember he was wearing a white safari suit, no shoes on his feet. He had a black and white small TV watching the World Cup yeah. where Maradona shone through, right? The Mexico yeah. World Cup. And uh, he was sitting there with his feet up on his desk. And he said, Beta, you go inside there, they're doing your test. I was doing an EC ECG and a stress test. I'll be in there in 15 minutes. So I said, Doc, if they're close to scoring, please call me. Because you like football, huh? From that minute, I love the man. Yeah. He just told me that the longer you run and the harder you run, the stronger the heart is going to be. Ooh, nice. He said, you keep running. You keep working out, you keep enjoying your life. In 2003, was, I was very blessed to have a great team of doctors around me. And uh, they... The first radiologist said my playing days were done and uh, I definitely needed uh, surgery. A bunch of medication later, almost about a year and a half it took to lose all the weight from the medication. I put on 128 pounds after that. So you put on about 45 kilos? Somewhere there. 45, 52. 40? That's another human being. You ate another human being. <laughs> yeah. You ate a junior tennis player. That's right. You put on 50 kilos. Why did you put on 50 kilos? Just the medication. Yeah. Just the medication from it. And I was just very happy to have my life back again. So, um, having a new lease of, of life at that time, I knew I wanted to come back and play my fourth Olympics in yeah. Athens. I knew that was a goal because I had promised Dad when I was 10 years old that I'd play four Olympics. Yeah. I didn't know how I was going to get to my first, yeah. but I was going to play four. <laughs> so, you overshot that target by a bit, did you? Well done with seven, man. So your medal at Atlanta. <laughs> yes. Is that your? Is that the happiest day of your life? I know that's a big call, winning that medal for India because I know how much playing for India means to you. And happiest day of my life is Ayana being born. Um, okay. Happiest day as an athlete, yeah. Atlanta 96. Um, the hard work, ever since I was a young boy and used to polish my dad's bronze medal from 72. And to grow up as a young boy, um, idolizing your father, all you ever wanted to do, I wanted to do was to emulate him. Mm -hmm. So I could sit at the dining table with him knowing that I had my medal too. Yeah. In Atlanta, he was in the stands. In fact, uh, in the semi-finals, he was sitting with Andre Agassi's dad. 
when uh, Andre and myself yeah. were playing each other and they were bitching about us. <laughs> so, nice. halfway through the game, uh, Andre walked up to them on a side chain and said, what are you guys talking about? You should be in different ends of the court. Yeah. And they're like, no, we're just bitching about you guys. <laughs> so, both our fathers were Olympians as well and I guess, proud moment for them but an even proud moment for both of us sons to have our dads there. That's what I've tried to do ever since I was about 12 years old, is to work hard enough to prove that we could be number one in the world. Yeah. And that's the, the movement that I, I love to be on, is to creating a difference to um, the youngsters in our country um, to be the best they can be. It's, it's a very gratifying feeling when these young 20 year olds come around and say, Uncle, uh, you motivated us to be who we are. So do you say, well great, congratulations, but Uncle is <laughs> Exactly. A lot of the growing up boy stuff that you have in your early teens and things, the blank calls to the girls, <laughs> the you know trying to sort of catch somebody's eye, that kind of stuff. You yeah, I missed out on all the did you all the prank calls and the blank calls. Yeah, you were pretty I mean, blinkers on, focused right through and through when you're pretty young. On saying that, the world became your stage, so you had to grow up very fast. Mm. Say at uh, the cricket team, the hockey team, the soccer team of the country. Your expenses are looked after and what you earn is your prize money. Yeah. In individual sport in India, you do not have a club or a team that looks after your expenses. Every single expense that we have is paid out of our prize money or our sponsorship. So hence, as a professional tennis player, yeah. you're spending about two and a half crores to three and a half crores every single year, depending wow. on how big your entourage is. Yeah, you too, man, yeah. I know that in the first 10, 15 years of my career and in the last couple years of my career, you don't break even, you lose money. But uh, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into excellence and, and I just put it down to that. Uh, I haven't spent a birthday home since I was 12 years old. Wow! Uh, my birthday is in the summer and it's yeah. normally just the week before Wimbledon. Yeah. So the preparation for Wimbledon is so intense and so focused that I haven't spent a birthday home since I was 12. Um, before Ayana was born, I hadn't spent a Christmas home. Mm. Um, but now every Christmas I make sure I'm home with her. When you were a kid, I, I know you slept in like locker rooms and stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was where? Where was that? Wolfsburg, Germany. It was the height of winter. It was uh, 14th of November and uh, had about 20 francs in my pocket at the time. Hmm. And I uh, didn't have money for a hotel room. I just had my return ticket back to India. I'd been on the road for 10 months in a row. It's pretty broken down, pretty yeah. jaded, pretty uh, exhausted from the travel. I wasn't winning many matches back then. It was 1991. I was in Germany and I knew I had to win my qualifying match the next day to get my hotel room covered. It was the last round of college. Yeah. And uh, I bought the locker room attendant uh, espresso with five francs of the 20 I had. Yeah. And with his broken English and my broken German, I managed to convince him to let me sleep in the locker room. So that night at midnight, he uh, locked me in. He gave me three towels. He says, one, as your bed, two, as your pillow and three next morning you shower <laughs> and he came back the next morning at 5 45 in the morning woke me up and said shower and uh, before everyone else comes in is what i gathered from his broken english there have been two times in my career where i've almost uh, packed it up in 91 i decided to play the pros only and i was getting beaten up so badly that i came back after wolfsburg and i threw my bags into my cupboard my racket bags into the cupboard and I verbalized and said it pretty uh, strong to my dad, I'm never playing this sport ever again. Um, for eight weeks, he didn't say one word to me about tennis after that. Four weeks of that was the off-season, and the other four weeks was the first week of the, of the new season. He didn't say a word to me. By about the fifth or the sixth week, I asked mom, is dad feeling all right? <laughs> <laughs> Why is he not saying and, uh, anything? Exactly, and she goes, you're always going to be a son. You could be a tennis champion or you could not, you could do anything in the world. You're going to be his son, he's never going to push you. Sixth week, I said, ah, he'll come around. Seventh week, he still didn't say anything. By the eighth week, I managed to find my rackets and found my stride again. And uh, I started finding my own. That hunger that burned yeah. deep inside me, I kind of found that passion again. But I think Wolfsburg and uh, the November, December of 91 were very big in my career to rekindle that passion for sport. The difference between a boy or a man to being a participant or a champion yeah to being a champion or a legend 
a little difference is inherent within so you've you know won all these titles you won the most number of probably individual trophies that's won by any any indian sportsman you've got the olympic medal but one of the the great achievements one of the pinnacles of your career uh and i want to talk about that has been rajdhani express <laughs> <laughs> pinnacles did you say <laughs> thank you sir <laughs> Okay, let the guy I would let you know let, that the critics said I did a decent job for a newcomer. Also oh, critics are being bought back then also. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But you did did you like it? You had fun? You Yes, won. I watched Rajasthani. I thought I were I did well in it. <laughs> I thought that I deserved the lifetime achievement award for that. Uh, no one complained. Do you have an objection? <laughs> I don't. I don't. You sure? You sure? At least in this room <laughs> Let the guy who's not done a bad movie cast the first stone. <laughs> It's not going to be anybody in this room, that's for sure. <laughs> you had me at hello, and you complete me. I heard. How sad. <laughs> बच्चा अगर आप इस वीडियो को अगले 10 सेकंड में चार लोगों के साथ शेयर करेंगे तो अगले आधे घंटे में आपकी लाइफ में कुछ बहुत अच्छा होगा तथास्तु यहाँ पे सब्सक्राइब करें और यहाँ पे पुराने एपिसोड देखें चुप झुक जियो